Welcome everyone to the, um, that's the second lecture for this year, the second Anne Kabansky visiting lecture. My name is Miriam Bradella and I'm the rector of the Center for Faculty Development. And I'm so excited to have a speaker today from Cape Town, South Africa, Dr. Ninke Honewald, who will be talking about subcortical brain regions and anxiety disorders, findings from the Enigma anxiety, from Enigma anxiety. Next. Okay. So now before we start, I would like to talk a little bit about the Anne Klebanski Visiting Scholar Award, which was uh, conceived here in the Center for Faculty Development in 2020, when there was a disproportional effect of the COVID-19 pandemic on women and who were leaving the workforce because of additional household and childcare responsibilities. But even before COVID, women were less likely to be visiting professors because of challenging related to travel. And um, because of the COVID-19 restriction, many grant rounds and virtual uh, and professorships were being conducted virtually. So we thought we use the silver lining and start an award that allows women at MGH to be a virtual visiting professor at a national or international institutions. And so far we have 99 women faculty, either clinicians, educators or researchers or postdoc who have shown exceptional promise in or as leaders in their field and who would benefit from a national or international speaking or mentoring or networking opportunities. These women have been identified and have served as virtual visiting professor at um, other institutions. And our scholars also receive mentoring and professional coaching and leadership training. So the award was named after Anne Klebanski, the CEO of Mass General Brigham and former director of the Center for Faculty Development and the head of the neuroendocrine unit. And she is a very successful NIH funded researcher and a strong advocate for women. She established the Claflin Scholar Award for Women Faculty in the MGH Backup Daycare Center. Here's just an overview over the first cohort of women and the second. And now I thought this would be a one-time thing and then we would be back to normal, but we now have our third cohort Cohort we just selected, and we are now going to select the fourth cohort. Um, I just want to give a big shout out to our champions. These are the faculty members who are on the review committee and who are actually the ones who make these connections happen. They are the true sponsors of our women. They are the ones who send the email and pick up the phone to connect our women to a national or international institution. So a big thank you to those. We then started the Klebanski Visiting Lecture Series to promote as many women in the world as possible. And so this lecture series gives the opportunity of a woman faculty from the host institution that it hosted one of our Klebanski scholars to give a talk here at MGH. And we open these lectures to both um, communities and it's always nice to see some different names and faces um, during these lectures. Um, here is just an overview of some of the institutions where our scholars have um, given lectures, and I want to highlight the University of Cape Town in Cape Town, South Africa. And now it's my great, great pleasure to introduce um, Amanda Baker, one of our Klebanski scholars who I think has given a talk in South Africa and who will introduce our scholar today, our speaker. Amanda, the word, microphone Thanks. is yours. Thank you so much. Yes, it's my absolute pleasure to get to introduce Dr. Groenwald, who is a senior lecturer in the Department of Psychiatry and Mental Health at uh, and at the Neuroscience Institute of the University of Cape Town, South Africa. She has a background in clinical psychology and neuroscience, and her main research interests concerns neuroimaging of depressive and anxiety disorders throughout the lifespan. In 21-22, she was awarded a Carnegie Developing Emerging Academic Leaders Fellowship to study changes in brain development following adverse antenatal exposures in South African children with a special emphasis on maternal depression exposure. Uh, she currently leads a study on emotional disorders in South African adolescents, as well as uh, collaborative international research projects on anxiety disorders as a co-chair of Enigma Anxiety, which we are so lucky to get to hear more about now. So please take it away. Thank you so much for being here today. Um, thank you, Amanda, for the introduction. And let me share my screen. Um, okay, so today I will give a presentation about subcortical brain regions and anxiety disorders, findings from the Enigma Anxiety Working Group. Uh, I will start off with a bit of a background of neurobiological models of anxiety disorders. I will tell you more about the larger Enigma Consortium and our specific working group, uh, Enigma Anxiety. I will show you um, some of the, our first published findings on subcortical volumes in anxiety disorders and also some preliminary data. And I will end off with limitations and a conclusion. 
um, first to start with some statistics on anxiety disorders. The prevalence estimates for anxiety disorders um, vary um, worldwide, but generally they are about two to four percent for generalized anxiety disorder, six to seven percent for social anxiety disorder. Specific phobia is the most prevalent anxiety disorder with 10 to 12 percent prevalence, and panic disorder um, has again a relatively low prevalence of two to three uh, percent. Anxiety disorders within an anxiety disorder working group are considered separate from trauma and stress-related disorders, such as post-traumatic stress disorder, and also separate from obsessive-compulsive disorders, um, as they are also classified in the DSM-5. Um, anxiety disorders are more prevalent in females, and um, when looking at the lifespan trajectory, there's often an at-risk phenotype in childhood, with an onset in adolescence. The onset, of course, varies for the multiple anxiety disorders, with an earlier onset, for example, for specific phobia and social anxiety disorder, and a much later onset for panic disorder. Um, but the thing that anxiety disorders have in common is that they are very persistent, and they tend to persist uh, into adulthood. Um, when looking at the neurobiology of anxiety disorders, uh, historically there has been an amygdala-centric view. Um, so the amygdala is considered uh, the main neurobiological region involved in anxiety disorders as it's labeled the first circuit through its um, involvement in fear processing. Um, and most of the uh, older neurobiological models focus mostly on the amygdala um, as a driver of the behavioral symptoms of anxiety and anxiety disorders. So defensive reactions such as freezing, um, whereas defensive actions are thought to also involve um, the striatum in the brain. Both the amygdala and the striatum are subcortical regions of the brain. Uh, um, however, in more recent neurobiological models of anxiety disorders tend to also um, involve more cognitive processing, uh, which is thought to be mediated by cortical systems. Uh, and in addition, uh, a cognitive assessment is also thought to be driven by the bad nucleus of the stri uh, stria terminalis, uh, especially regarding uncertainty processing. So there is a distinction being made in literature between fear, which is more behavioral, and anxiety, which is more cognitive. And this is also a way to look at the individual anxiety disorders uh, differently as they can all lie on this axis uh, of fear and anxiety, with especially generalized anxiety uh, being a very cognitive uh, anxiety disorder. Um, however, the neurobiology of anxiety disorders is much wider than only the amygdala and the striatum. Um, here we present an, an overview of the literature, and this classification is based on the fall uh, 2015, but we have relabeled the regions that are highlighted in this article um, to be more in line with the Enigma streams. Uh, anatomical classifications. So here in the left panel, you see subcortical regions that are implicated in anxiety disorders, and they are um, labeled as either sensory processing regions, for example, the thalamus, emotion processing regions. Uh, here we see the amygdala, but also the striatum, and then emotion modulation regions, uh, amongst other stable campus. Uh, in addition, you see cortical regions that are highlighted. Uh, in the center, you see the brain in the medial view, um, and here, the interior cingulate and medial prefrontal cortex are important regions, whereas laterally, um, the uh, most important emotion modulation region is the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, which you see here split over the superior frontal region and the rostral middle frontal region, and also the insula, um, which is involved in emotion processing. However, um, just to clarify in the current presentation, I will only focus on subcortical regions, so the regions that you see in the left panel here. Um, so one of the problems in the literature is that there is very little convergence in magnetic resonance imaging findings within anxiety disorders. And this is particularly the case for structural magnetic resonance imaging uh, studies. Um, so one of the difficulties is that small sample sizes limit power, and this may also limit the reproducibility of findings. Uh, typically, anxiety disorder samples are approximately 20 to 30 patients for neuroimaging studies, although there are, are some uh, remarkable initiatives, for example, in Germany, which include more than 100 panic disorder persons, but uh, also here at Harvard uh, is a very large study um, that has been conducted. Uh, in addition, anxiety disorders are characterized by clinical heterogeneity. Uh, one important source um, is, for example, comorbidities. So anxiety disorders have a high comorbidity with each other, but also with major depressive disorder and substance use disorders. Um, 
and age of onset, for example, is also a very important uh, clinical characteristic that sets um, yeah, individuals apart. Uh, then furthermore, in the literature, there's also analytical heterogeneity because every sample is analyzed often in their own way. There are voxel-based methods. Um, there are region-based methods. There are also um, some studies focus on specific regions of interest, most importantly the amygdala, uh, and there are other studies that look at the whole brain. So region-based approaches may overlook certain important findings um, because they can be biased towards um, regions that are uh, most often studied. So um, as a solution, we are conducting large multi cohort comparisons of brain structure between individuals with and without anxiety disorders within Enigma. And we use harmonized processing methods across all of these different cohorts to uh, reduce the analytical heterogeneity involved. And in doing so, we are able to uh, conduct analysis with very, very large sample sizes. Um, so we are doing this as part of the Enigma initiative. Here you see a picture of Professor Paul Thompson, who is the principal investigator of Enigma, which stands for Enhancing Neuroimaging Genetics Through Meta-Analysis. Um, this initiative aims to find genes that help or harm the brain that are implicated in brain disorders um, by looking at the brain as an endophenotype. So um, the hypothesis is that genes may affect the brain more directly. And therefore, markers that predict genetic markers that predict the C status um, might also show strong connections with brain phenotypes. Um, and looking at the brain as an intermediate phenotype may increase power to identify novel genes. Um, so um, they have conducted multiple genome-wide association studies of brain phenotypes, um, which have been published in Nature uh, for the subcortical brain structures and in science. Uh, there's an important publication, Genetic Architecture of the Human Cerebral Cortex, both of which have identified novel genetic variants that are related to brain development. Um, here, um, we are the leaders of the Enigma Anxiety Working Group, so I am uh, one of the chairs together with Professor Dan Stein here in Cape Town, South Africa, but also together with Dr. Bas Hogendam and Professor Van der Wey, who are based in Leiden, the Netherlands, and together we lead a working group. It's a global enterprise at the intersection of mental health and neuroscience, and we aim to advance understanding of the brain characteristics associated with anxiety disorders. We have four focal groups um, that are based on individual anxiety disorders, generalized anxiety disorder, social anxiety disorder, specific phobia, and panic disorder. However, we also have new, very interesting groups that I won't present on today, but I just want to mention, which is an inhibited temperance uh, group, which focuses on inhibited temperament as a risk factor for anxiety disorder in children. So again, uh, taking the intermediate phenotype approach. And in addition, we have a new group that's focused on fear conditioning, which is of course a, a very important uh, process in anxiety in general and anxiety disorders in particular. And um, here you see our overview paper that we have published in uh, Human Brain Mapping, which outlines the rationale and the organization of our working group. Um, we currently have more than 200 members worldwide. Um, you can see that we are con the members are concentrated in Europe and the United States, but we are very proud that we also have members in Brazil, South Africa, um, Turkey, China, Japan, and South Korea. And this um, map is a little bit outdated because we recently also um, attracted new members in Australia. So um, we really strive to be a global initiative. Um, here, I want to explain to you um, what our analytical approach is. Um, there are um, different ways to aggregate data across multiple cohorts. And um, more the, the traditional approach is to conduct a meta-analysis without access to individual participant data. So for example, based on published studies um, where um, this approach is characterized by a lot of analytical heterogeneity because you are dependent on how the researchers have analyzed their published findings. Um, it's also possible to do a meta-analysis with harmonized processing, which is the Enigma approach, which you see in the uh, second panel here, where the sites reanalyze their data and all do so in a standardized way. 
They then send the group comparison results to a central site for processing and a meta-analysis is conducted here. However, within Enigma Anxiety, we are um, increasingly relying on mega-analytic approaches, which means that the individual participant data is transferred uh, to a site. So some of our projects work with uh, derived brain metrics that were, uh, so the images are processed locally at the sites and the brain metrics at an individual participant level are shared with a coordinating site for mega analysis. And we are also now starting to acquire raw imaging data, which the sites then send to a central coordinating facility um, for harmonized processing. So then we also harmonize the operating system and all of the individual pre-processing settings and steps um, across the samples. Uh, so today we'll present data from generalized anxiety disorder, which has uh, conducted, this group has conducted a one-step analysis with transfer of raw imaging data for centralized analysis and social anxiety disorder, specific phobia and panic disorder have conducted two-step analyses with coordinated imaging processing at each individual site with standardized protocols, and then a subsequent central mega-analysis of the derived brain metrics. Um, generalized anxiety disorder is published as Hardewijn et al. in translation of psychiatry. It contains data from 28 research samples with 1120 individuals with generalized anxiety disorders and more than 3000 controls. This uh, meta-analysis was pre-registered on the open science framework. And um, the main analysis included random slopes per site and random intercepts per scanner. Scanner and site can be slightly different concepts uh, in our work because some sites um, conduct investigations across multiple MRI scanners, and we also control our analysis um, with scanner as a covariate, or in this case, as a random intercept. Um, here, there were no significant findings in the main analysis. There were also no significant interactions between generalized anxiety disorder, age, and sex. However, the secondary analysis um, with fixed slopes across sites, found a GDA by sex interaction in the ventral diencephalon, um, which you see um, depicted here. It's located underneath the thalamus. And um, this was a bit of a counterintuitive finding where we found um, that, um, as you see here in the, the bar graph, there was no difference between, fem between females with JD and healthy controls, but there was a difference where males with JD had a larger volume of the ventral diencephalon. Um, this was significant after comparison for multiple corrections. I must say that in this article, multiple corrections uh, comparison was relatively strict because it was family-wise error correction that was conducted across all possible comparisons that were conducted in the article um, by means of permutation. Um, so the ventral diencephalon includes the hypothalamus, uh, so there was a larger volume of males and no difference in females with GAD. Um, this was, as I explained, a bit unexpected because previous studies of generalized anxiety disorder and anxiety severity have showed smaller and not larger volumes. Um, we did find a gender difference. Uh, so perhaps um, larger volumes were found with uh, samples with predominantly female patients, and we found uh, our finding in male patients. And there also is regional variability within the ventral diencephalon that can perhaps account for the different findings. Uh, our findings are aligned with the gender paradox hypothesis, uh, which says that the less frequently affected sex may manifest more severe features of the disorder. Uh, there's some support for this idea from structural connectivity studies in anxiety disorders. Um, Unfortunately, we do not know whether there are differences in the ventral diencephalon for the other anxiety disorders that we are investigating because it's not included in the Enigma pipeline that was used um, for these disorders. Um, so that is something that remains to be determined. Um, then uh, the social anxiety disorder paper was published uh, just now, actually this month in molecular psychiatry. Uh, we included data from 37 research samples with 1120 individuals with social anxiety disorder and more than 2,500 controls. And we conducted a mega analysis on 14 volumes with random intercepts per scanner. Um, we also tested the model with a random slope, but this does not fit our data better than the model. Uh, a model without random slope. So we chose a more parsimonious model here. And 
um, what we also did is that we separated the regions into left and right hemispheres. We observed a social anxiety disorder by age interaction for the left putamen, which survived uh, correction for multiple comparisons. And therefore, we separated our sample into adults and adolescents with a split at 21 years of age. And we um, found very little differences uh, between adolescents with social anxiety disorder and controls and more pronounced differences for adults with social anxiety disorders versus controls. And we saw a nice bilateral pattern of a smaller bilateral putamen volume and a larger bilateral pallidum volume, which is adjacent to the putamen um, in uh, adults on the social anxiety disorder. And I think it's quite striking here that, that the age attraction was only significant for the left putamen, but the pattern is very similar across all of these four um, structures. Um, so the putamen by functional imaging research has been implicated in uh, reward processing and reward processing deficiencies in anxiety disorders. In the context of social anxiety disorders, this may reflect an intense desire to avoid failure in social contexts. Um, most of the research on the striatum in, in social anxiety disorder stems from adolescents, uh, as this is um, a period in which the reward system matures and, and undergoes uh, heavy development. Um, but we only saw it in a, a structural findings so only in adults. So we think there might be a possible link with persistence of social anxiety disorder symptoms into adulthood. Um, this might also explain why we see this interaction with age, which was also with age as a continuous measure. Um, there are some data linking this to inhibited temperament and familial social anxiety disorder, which suggests a possible endophenotype. Um, However, there are some conflicting findings in the literature as well, and we believe that regional variability in the basal ganglia complex uh, deserves further investigation. Um, I also want to mention some secondary analysis that we did. We also looked at comorbidities and age of onset, and we did find a smaller left amygdala volume in um, participants with social anxiety disorder, but only those with comorbid anxiety disorders, which is interesting, uh, especially because, yeah, this might be linked to genetic load. We did previously also identify a genetic overlap between anxiety disorders and amygdala volume. Um, and in addition, we found a small right hippocampus volume, but only in patients with a very early age of onset of social anxiety disorder. This again was more pronounced in uh, adults with an early onset, which also suggests a link perhaps with uh, duration of illness or disease persistence. Um, then to show the results for the specific phobia group, uh, this was the, the largest investigation that we've conducted uh, with 43 research samples, almost 1,500 individuals with specific phobia and almost 3,000 controls. Here, um, yeah, for social anxiety disorders, we separated between the left and the right hemispheres because um, there is some evidence of lateralized involvement of the amygdala. However, um, this is less the case for specific phobia. So here, um, the regions were combined, and uh, what you see here is the sound volume uh, across the left and the right hemisphere. So this is a meta-analysis on seven bilateral volumes and its cranial volume with random intercepts per scanner. And here, um, interestingly, we see a very similar pattern as for social anxiety disorder, where there is a larger pallidum and a smaller putamen volume. Uh, in addition, there was also a smaller hippo, bilateral hippocampus volume and nucleus accumbens volume in specific phobia. Uh, when separated into adults and adolescents, um, we do see that the findings are a bit stronger um, in adults, specifically for the pallidum, similar to social anxiety disorder, but here the diagnosis by age interaction was not significant. Um, this article is presently uh, still under review, so these are preliminary uh, data. Um, this, the basal ganglia complex is not typically implicated in specific phobia, um, so the findings contrast with, again, amygdala-centric literature. Um, we see similarities in findings to social anxiety disorder, but not generalized anxiety disorder, which might um, su suggest that these brain differences uh, are more typical for a phobia phenotype. Um, there is a possible link with persistence of specific phobia symptoms into adulthood. And again, the regional variability deserves further investigation. 
Um, here, the clinical subgroup analysis showed that the cortical findings were mainly driven by animal phobia and not by blood injection injury phobias. Uh, however, it must be noted that the blood injection injury phobias also had a much smaller sample size. Um, then the findings for panic disorder um, by Han et al. Uh, this is in preparation for submission. Um, here we have data from 37 research samples with more than 1,100 individuals with panic disorders and more than 3,000 controls. Here, the left and the right uh, hemispheres were again separated. So we have 14 cortical volumes with random intercepts per scanner, similar to the SAD analysis that I showed previously. Um, but the findings are very different. We find a smaller volume in the bilateral caudate and also in the right thalamus in panic disorder versus controls. Um, here, we did not conduct analysis separately for adults and adolescents. There was no significant um, disorder by age interaction, um, not for subcortical volumes, although there were some trends for cortical regions, especially when age was squared. So these are nonlinear interactions. Um, I also must note that for panic disorder, we have very few adolescents. Um, yeah, I think this is consistent with, with just the general epidemiology of the disorder that is more prevalent in, in adults. Um, so a tentative interpretation, um, this is very preliminary, these are new findings. Um, it, I, I saw that it's consistent with results from some older studies, but not with recent meta-analyses. And the thalamus has been implicated in sensory processing, as I highlighted before in a neurobiological model section. And the caudate is implicated in the motor output of the basal ganglia system, which is also interesting in the context of panic disorder. And some authors have suggested that the implication, yeah, that the, the um, involvement of the caudate may reflect the field suppression of the autonomic response to cognitive and sensory events in the context of panic disorder. Um, what is uh, yeah, striking is that panic disorder has quite a unique profile relative to the other anxiety disorders. Um, I also want to show you an overview of the effect sizes that we have found. They were shown in the um, individual graphs, but here just all of them together. Um, I want to note that we report mixed effects D estimates as effect size. This is an effect size estimate that is adjusted um, for non-independence as the data is clustered within the individual samples, and this effect size estimate is, is adjusted. For, for that clustered variant. Um, previous Enigma studies have reported Cohen's D, which is similarly scaled and can be interpreted similarly, uh, although mixed effects D estimates in our experience and also in literature tend to um, be a little bit smaller because of the additional adjustment that takes place for non-independence. So um, in social anxiety disorder, um, in the full age sample, we see D estimates of around uh, 0.10. For specific phobia, um, they are about 0.10 to 0.15. And again, panic disorder is around 0.10. Uh, when we look in the adult subgroups, the effect size estimates are uh, a bit larger. So there we have the putamen and the pallidum um, for social anxiety disorder and specific phobia with effect size estimates around minus 0.15 and 0.25 even for the pallidum in specific phobia. Um, and the comments has a, has a, a smaller uh, estimate. Um, so taken together, these effect sizes for anxiety disorder are somewhat comparable in magnitude to those observed in previous Enigma studies of uh, anxiety-related conditions, such as OCD, PTSD, and MDD. Um, these all report a coincidence of approximately minus 0.15 for the bilateral hippocampus in their main analysis. They are substantially smaller than previously observed for schizophrenia, um, which reported a coincidence of almost minus 0 0.5, uh, also for the hippocampus. So, um, um, of course, power also determines the sensitivity that you have to find certain effect sizes, and we have power to detect effect sizes of around 0.10. Um, these are small effect sizes. Uh, however, we still think it's it's interesting to compare them to the other disorders. Schizophrenia is often thought to be a more severe disorder and a, a more neuroprogressive disorder, perhaps, uh, and the data uh, to support this notion. However, the anxiety disorders are relatively similar to OCD, PTSD, and MDD. 
um, although we observe uh, different regions um, because most of our findings are in the basal ganglia, whereas and the other um, conditions found strongest effects for the hippocampus. Um, so there are some limitations to our work, although we do our best to harmonize processing across all of the different samples, there is some remaining methodological heterogeneity, this has to do with data acquisition. Um, so data was conducted on scanners with different field strengths, for example, uh, most of the data was acquired on three Tesla, but some on 1.5 Tesla. Um, different scan sequences were used in the different scanners, and um, also not all sites used the same version of FreeSurfer. Um, in our work group, we mainly use 5.3 and 6.0 so far. Um, furthermore, we are a little bit dependent on how the sites have acquired uh, and collected their data and variables are inconsistently collected across samples. So we do have data on symptom severity, but in a much smaller uh, sample. And we have analyzed these according to the different severity measures. So we do have quite a bit of data on the state trait anxiety inventory and on the back depression inventory, for example. Um, but we haven't find, found strong associations with symptom severity at all. Um, but unfortunately, uh, we also have less power in these analyses. Um, limitations of the source data sets also apply to our aggregated data sets. So most of these samples have conducted cross-sectional comparisons and there might be some uh, selection biases, um, especially for clinical samples versus population samples. And uh, most of the samples included are clinical samples. Um, here I present to you only the volume of subcortical regions. So we have not used, looked at cortical morphology yet, although these results are coming. And um, we also do not report results on brain function, which may show uh, different results. Um, we strongly feel that long longitudinal research is needed to delineate the trajectories of polymetric alterations um, in the different anxiety disorders um, to confirm whether these volumetric differences that we see are stable over time in specific subgroups. So for example, there could be a specific subgroup of social anxiety and specific phobia patients that have uh, very persistent symptoms from the outset and it also showed the most pronounced findings and that the subgroup that um, uh, remits um, has much less uh, neurobiological differences. It's also possible that these differences newly emerge following critical stages of development. Um, so after 21 years of age or after adolescence, uh, it's also possible um, that the differences that we see aggravate with longer illness duration. So some of our analysis um, showing age interactions and associated with early age of onset are suggestive of the latter, but we cannot give any strong answers on this because of the cross-sectional nature of our data. Um, then I would like to tell you about the future directions. I already mentioned the cortical projects that we uh, are starting. Um, we are also starting to look into resting state fMRI. Here I will lead the social anxiety disorder um, investigation, um, but we are also conducting investigations for the other anxiety disorders and we are planning a big cross disorder comparison as well. Um, in addition, I supervise two PhD students um, that are are going to conduct analysis in enigma anxiety. One is now currently investigating brain aging and anxiety disorders. So again, focusing on, uh, on the, the neurodevelopmental nature uh, of the, different, of the um, brain differences. And another one has an interesting subtyping of anxiety disorders, and she wants to see if she can classify uh, the different anxiety disorders based on multimodal neuroimaging data, uh, making use of deep learning. So these are projects that are now really starting. In addition, uh, in the further future, we hope to also conduct imaging genetic studies of anxiety disorders. But before we can do that, we still uh, need to aggregate the genotyping data across of our, all of our cohorts. But we do have quite a bit of genotyping potential where approximately 50% of our samples uh, have genotyping data available. Um, so the Enigma Anxiety Working Group is a global enterprise at the intersection of mental health and neuroscience. We aim to advance understanding of the brain characteristics associated with anxiety disorders. Our collaboration so far has revealed subtle differences in volumes of subcortical brain regions and anxiety disorders. So we found a larger ventral encephalon mills with generalized anxiety disorder. We found smaller putamen and larger paladin volumes in adults with social anxiety disorder and specific phobia, whereas individuals with panic disorder showed a smaller caudic nucleus and also um, 
uh, a less robust finding in the thalamus. And there are also clinical sources of heterogeneity. For example, comorbid anxiety disorder was identified in the social anxiety disorder project. We provide an inclusive multidisciplinary research environment uh, that we hope will continue to inspire new avenues of research um, across the globe. Um, I want to give many thanks to um, the people at Enigma Central that support our work. Um, so the principal investigator, Paul Thompson, and also his larger theme with, uh, team, which includes Neda Jahanshad and uh, Sophia. Uh, also the leaders of the anxiety support groups, uh, I should especially mention Dr. Pine at the NIMH, who leads the Generalized Anxiety Disorder and Resting State Projects. Uh, Dr. Hilbert and Lucan at the University of Berlin, and uh, who lead the specific phobia uh, subgroup, and um, also Dr. Ariani uh, at Leiden University. He moved from Amsterdam to Leiden, who is the leader of the panic disorder subgroup. And of course, also all of our members who contribute data because this would not be possible without them. If you are interested and want to hear more, if you want to become a member, uh, please send us an email. So you can reach me uh, at the email address listed here uh, or the co-chair, Jan marie Bas Hoogendam from Leiden University. Thank you very much for your attention. Great, this was fantastic. Thank you. Really, I learned so much. Um, Amanda, you're going to lead our Q&A because you're much more qualified to do this than me. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, and please, you know, put questions in the chat or, you know, um, I think certainly this is a group where we can speak up and, and ask questions. I really just thank you so much for such a fantastic talk. It's really amazing to see such a collaboration and the ability to look at you know so much data in these pooled samples is is tremendous. I, I certainly I, I don't I'm gonna ask a question first if that's okay. Um, which is um, I certainly understand the benefit of looking you know by diagnostic criteria, um, but also think this is such an opportunity to look you know across this huge pool of, of anxiety uh, diagnoses as well as you know other diagnoses and kind of let the structural and functional neural hypotheses be the way to kind of divide things up. Um, I know you mentioned like a cross disorder in the future directions. Is that is that something that you're planning? Uh, yes. So um, we are planning a cross disorder comparison of the resting state data. Are we going to look at overlap and distinctions between different anxiety disorders? Uh, I must mention that, of course, we are led a little bit by the um, data that is available and uh, data has been collected very much according to diagnosis. There are not that many samples which look across multiple diagnoses. There are some, but not many. Um, we also uh, have an idea to look at subtyping that's more data-driven. Um, this will be a collaboration with someone at Columbia University, but this is still in a very early stage. So at the moment, it's, it's mainly an idea and we're still working it out, yeah. Fantastic. I'll stay tuned. Do folks have other questions? Is it okay if I just pipe in and ask my question via audio? Please. Great. Well, thank you for such a wonderful talk. I've been watching things come out of Enigma closely. I'm really interested, especially in the work that comes out of your anxiety group. I think it's really interesting that you're looking too at subcortical regions. I look a lot at subcortical regions for OCD. And it's interesting because the Enigma OCD group found some cortical act, subcortical activation, but in the adults, but not in the kids. So it's interesting that you're finding it then in the anxiety group. Is there going to be much collaboration between the OCD and the anxiety group? I know it's always kind of back and forth. Are those separate? Are those together? But there's so much diagnostic overlap. And now you're seeing activation in similar regions that we often see in OCD. So is, the, yeah. is there any kind of future collaboration between those groups there? Um, we are definitely very interested in doing so at the moment. So the, the uh, subtyping effort that we are describing uh, is still being set up and is being led by the Enigma PTSD group. So we are planning to look more broadly, uh, not only in anxiety disorder, but also in anxiety related conditions. It would be fantastic if OCD could also be included in that. Yeah. Thanks. Um, yeah. 
And just as a follow-up, in terms of, um, I know you said you're limited by what data is collected, and you had talked about adults. In some cases, you were able to split that out to adolescents. Are they also going to be able to look at um, pediatric anxiety cases? Yeah, that's a, a great question. Um, we are definitely interested in that. Um, so at the moment, we have only split them into two groups. So the adolescents do include children as well. Perhaps I should say child and adolescent anxiety disorders. So um, we do have data from about five years of age. Um, so, so those are grouped together in that comparison. Um, there, there, we do have some, some child data, um, especially from the NIMH, has a large cohort called ESTEN. Uh, there's the Pennsylvania and their imaging cohort, which also has young children. Uh, Washington University has a, has a child sample, but um, I think at the moment the problem is just power because we don't have enough child samples to look at individual disorders, but uh, we hope that if we look at data across uh, all of the different disorders that our power will be better. I, could, I should also mention we also have a paper now that um, is currently, I think, in preparation for submission which looks at transdiagnostic classifications um, within youth with anxiety disorders. So uh, combining the data from all different anxiety disorders together. And very surprisingly, there we found that it was easiest to classify um, children or, or young, yeah, young people, youth with um, panic disorder compared to the other anxiety disorders, which I think is again, uh, quite surprising, especially because panic disorder is not very commonly seen in, in young children. Um, but the yeah, the, the neuroanatomical deviation seems to be largest in, in that disorder category. And the, the classification accuracies for the other disorders were very low. But we do see this, this pattern where we, we have this age interaction that I showed you now. So that that is in line with that whole picture that unfortunately for social anxiety disorder, or well, fortunately for the children for social anxiety disorder and uh, specific phobia, we don't have clear um, hints uh, for the neurobiology of anxiety disorders in this population, um, at least not when it comes to supportable avoidance. So um, yeah, the, the classification that I mentioned now was only based on structural data. Um, I suspect based on literature that we may be able to find more differences when we start looking at the functional data. So interesting. Are there other questions from the audience? Um, hi, I, I was just curious um, <clears throat> as to what you think, I, I realize this is structural, not functional, but what you think might be um, going on with the commonality of the striatum um, across all these different disorders, uh, again, functionally, what you, you think might be going on. Yeah. Um... It's something that I would like to investigate further, very much so. So um, what I, I hope to do uh, as one, one of my interests for the functional data is to look at resting state functional connectivity from the individual uh, subregions in the striatum, hopefully with a seed-based approach to tease apart uh, that a little bit further. Um, but yeah, so for social anxiety disorder interpretation, is, is perhaps a little bit easier when it comes to, to reward processing deficiencies uh, in the sense that, that social interactions are not perceived to be as rewarding as they are um, in people without social anxiety. And that also perhaps the, the drive, the motivation to engage in social interaction is, is lower in participants with social anxiety disorder. Um, so, so yeah, I, I think the speculating, um, I, I think, could be perhaps a, a lower drive to engage. Um, and, and that might be also associated perhaps with the reduced motivation to overcome fears. Do you see any uh, dorsal ventral sort of differences in the striatum? Uh, <laughs> Yeah, uh, excellent question. So that's why uh, we would like to do um, follow up with, with more um, 
more fine-grained analysis, so to speak. So right now we have only looked at the regions as a whole. So I cannot say anything about that based on, on these data, but um, some large studies that have been conducted previously um, have looked at that. And um, within social anxiety disorder, there have been conflicting findings where um, meta-analysis have shown, um, uh, now I must say it correctly, from the, I think, smaller volumes in the putamen, whereas a mega-analysis found a larger volume. So there was a left-right difference here, but there was also a dorsal ventral difference. Um, so, so it definitely, if I say it correctly, I think that the smaller volume has been found more often ventrally and the larger volume has been found more often in the dorsal striatum. But with our data, um, we haven't looked at that yet. But this is a potential avenue to follow up further. Uh, yeah, so it's possible to look at, at, at the shape of subcortical regions with vertex wise analysis where we would be able to look at the dorsal and the ventral subregions. Do, do any um, of your contributors use 7T images? Is that becoming more common? I, I know their scanners are. Uh, yeah, the scanners are there, but in our, in our, uh, in our data, it's very rare. Um, uh, yeah. Um, so this is not really a, a factor in our analysis at the moment. But perhaps we will see more of that as we go forward. So we are, of course, our analysis are based on historic cohorts. So uh, many of the participating samples have been collected several years ago, um, sometimes even more than 10 years ago. Um, so we aggregate everything together. And um, there are some cores with ongoing data collection that are adding. So we're continuously sort of adding data. Um, so that, that should become more common in the future. One other a quick question. Um, are you looking at uh, DTI at all, at, at fiber tracts? Uh, we are planning, uh, well, we are working on one DTI uh, project in social anxiety disorder, but unfortunately, uh, I cannot report on any results from that yet. Um, so within the larger Enigma group, there are many DTI initiatives and there are DTI protocols for standardized processing. Um, but at the moment, these have not yet been taken up in our working group. We have decided to first focus on arresting state functional connectivity. I think because the functional literature in anxiety disorders is very uh, interesting. Uh, this is where our main interest lies at the moment. And perhaps in the future, we will also focus on, on tractography. Wonderful. So interesting to hear this the enormous sample size. Yes. So there, there are enormous possibilities, um, but um, aggregating the data is also very time consuming. So we are also a little bit inhibited, restricted by our capacity to run projects. But uh, and perhaps it's a good place to, to say that now here, now that I have the opportunity to present, we very much welcome plans for analysis from researchers. So um, if you think have a very interesting project in mind, you're most welcome to contact us and see if, if you can run a project with our data. Um, data sharing is continued on approval by all of the individual principal investigators of the original samples, of course, but you can um, write an analysis plan and present it in the group. Do you, do you um, communicate with the um, NIMH um, data archive? group that that's right. a lot of yes has ended up there and uh given the the requirement nowadays for for always submitting that data to the archives yes so that is a wonderful resource um so um dr daniel pine at nimh is one of our uh, key collaborators and um he does facilitate data sharing um, across the NIH, and we do draw from several rep repositories. So that is one of them. There are also um, other repositories that we can draw data from if our collaborators deposit their data mm -hmm. in the repository. There's one additional question in the chat I just wanted to draw your attention to as well, um, which says here, are the brain volumes age independent? Uh, no, they are not. So um, all of the analysis that um, we have presented here 
are adjusted. So um, maybe I should have explained this earlier. They are uh, generally adjusted for uh, sex and age. And we also adjust for interactions between sex and age. Uh, and then also often for nonlinear interactions between sex and age. Um, so there is an extensive age correction that has been applied um, to these uh, findings. In a, um, so as I explained, we did see a social anxiety disorder by age interaction. So the social anxiety disorder related volumetric differences are only seen in adults with social anxiety disorder. Whereas for specific phobia, um, the um, yeah, th there was not a, a clear significant interaction, or there was a trend for them to be more pronounced in adults. For panic disorder, there was no age interaction. Absolutely. Very lingering remaining question out there. Well, thank you so much. This is so wonderful, and it's such tremendous work and such a huge collaboration and team effort. It's fantastic. Really, really impressive. And thank you. Wonderful. Yeah, the comments in the chat. Thank you so much. And it was a pleasure to have you all the way from South Africa. <laughs> and thank you so much for having me. I very much appreciate the opportunity. And it's a great pleasure to present to you all. Beauty of Zoom <laughs> technology. Thank you. <laughs> yes. Thanks, everyone, for joining. Bye. Bye-bye.